Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good evening. My name is Eliza Wilson, and I want to thank you all for being here today. I serve as special assistant to the president here at Boston Architectural College, and I am delighted that you are all here to join us today for this experiment and conversation. Throughout the day, we have discovered a whole lot of unknowns ahead of us. However, what we have known and have learned for certain is that the conversations like the ones we're having here today are exactly what we must be doing to arrive at the place that we need to be at as we emerge into our post pandemic lives. And in particular, what that means for our students who are the future builders, leaders, and thinkers. It is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Prakash Koda, Autodesk's Chief Information Officer, Head of Global Infrastructure, Enterprise Business, Applications, Enterprise Security, Operations and Workforce Collaboration and Productivity Services. Prakash, you are passionate about aligning the employee, the partner and customer experience. You have accelerated this, transfer, this transformation for employees by providing IT services on demand through a self-service portal. And you know, much like us here at the BIC, you have worked through the implementation of modern cloud collaboration and productivity tools. So I am going to be calling you, uh, enabling your, your, your camera and audio, Prakash, to join us, to come on in and to help guide us to say hello. And as we, as we, Bring in our, our panelists as well. We have with us today, Linda, Megan, and Charles. Uh, Linda, Megan, and Charles will shortly be introducing themselves. We'll share a presentation from Megan and Charles, and then we will have a live conversation with Linda. Prakash, please feel free to continue to guide the conversation, and we will ask our audience to please ask questions in the chat, and we will get to them as we can. So I am going to bring up uh charles so charles uh yeah. you're getting yeah. the mic and your camera and you can hear and me okay? please we can hear you we can see you i am now going to leave the screen okay and then i will bring in uh, and then i will bring in megan and then linda we will only have three presenters on the screen visible at a time okay awesome hey charles <laughs> rakesh pleasure thank you very much for uh for joining us yeah, thank you for joining too. Looking forward to our chat. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I can go ahead and uh, introduce myself real quick. Um, I'm uh, Charles Polini. Uh, I'm an architect here in uh, Houston, Texas, originally from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm a graduate of the BAC. I graduated with the, uh, from the Distance Masters of Architecture program in 2016. Um, I work for uh, a firm here, um, uh, Harrison Kornberg in town, uh, do a lot of uh, higher education and aviation work. And our, our firm also does a bunch of K-12 and civic, um, as well as a little, uh, uh, um, little less so uh, corporate retail and residential. Um, I've been uh, currently since the, the uh, um, uh, state of Texas opened uh, here in in May or began their reopening afterwards. I've been leading our internal team um, to help us get back into the office uh, personally, um, but also uh, to try and take those lessons that we're learning from opening ourselves um, and uh, and help our clients uh, get back into their spaces in, in whatever capacity uh, they they want to or um, or can be. Cool. I'm going. I'm going to bring Megan on and first, so Megan can introduce herself. Sounds good. And Charles, you can control your mic now at the bottom. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yep. Hi, Megan. <laughs> Hi, guys. Megan Toner. I am a designer here in Seattle with uh, IA Interior Architects. Uh, I am a workplace expert. Um, I've got about eight years in the field. Uh, six of those are in New York. So um, I've just recently moved back to Seattle to where I'm from. If you can see behind me right there is our office. So I'm not there right now. <laughs> um, 
And yeah, so I'm a workplace expert. I uh, am incredibly lucky to be part of a phenomenal team of designers and design directors and strategists and spatial thinkers at IA. Um, uh, girls, I've been working in a lot with uh, leadership here in Seattle and across our firm on uh, response to uh, post-pandemic looks like, uh, in addition to uh, maintaining regular design work and uh, some strategy work as well. So it's great to be here. I look forward to our conversation tonight. Yeah, same here. Why don't we bring in Linda to Linda, you should be coming in with audio and video. Uh, Linda is right here. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. I don't uh, know. Probably we're seeing the uh, wrong camera. I gotta flip my camera, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that because I'm not technologically sad. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Hold on, guys. I'm going to be creative. Uh, Prakash, you might need to talk me through this, but I'll, I'll start speaking and then I'll find a way to get my, I don't know why my camera is inverted. I'm sitting in front of the computer. So, um, but my name is Linda Srigliano. I am a um, uh, construction manager. I was a senior project manager for years doing residential construction in Manhattan. And I am now um, five years ago started my own company where I kind of have established a hybrid system of merging both owner's representation and construction management services because I think the two go hand in hand. So it was kind of born out of out of a need and uh, basically that's my um, that's how my my company started. I have um, been working consistently in Manhattan for five years, primarily in residential. Um, and now um, also embark on some residential on some commercial projects, anywhere from ground up construction, townhouses, um, working in high rises, and recently have also merged with a couple of developers. So um, that is my hang on. I figured out how to do it. I am a technology person. All right. All of our lives, where we keep. We'll uh, playing around. It. There you go. I know. <laughs> I know. And for somebody who's very hands-on and used to being boots on the ground, converting everything to technology has been a little challenging for me. So, uh, <laughs> but I'm here now. So that's a little bit of an introduction. Yeah, and it's it's probably very relevant to the whole topic about the inverted workplace right. and how we get started. And that was, and how things that was totally inverted. So that was good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So, uh, first of all, thank you all. Uh, for, I know I'm meeting most of you for the first time too. I'm the CIO for Autodesk. Uh, I get excited when I see designers, architects, engineers, because all of you leverage Autodesk products <laughs> in some way or other during the design phase. So, we are very thrilled uh, when we see construction and all of these things going on. Uh, so, I'm, I'm glad to be sitting with you guys today to have this dialogue. Uh, I know Charles will be coming in and out because our on a rotation because there are only three video pools, I think, in a, on a screen. So why don't we get started, maybe uh, um, one of you, Linda or Megan, on what does the whole inverted workplace look like in your own field? Like the last, last 90 days, all of us are like, uh, overnight, we had to turn uh, down, like what does workplace mean? It changed all of a sudden for the entire world. And so what does this mean for your own uh, workspace? Megan, why don't you start? Since you're, uh, my workplace kind of just started a little bit more, so. Yeah. Can do. So we've seen, like you said, overnight a drastic shift, right, from the majority of our workplace. Do we want to, Liz, you want to put those back up and I'll run through them with us? Yeah, sure. So we've seen overnight everything shift, right? So I think one of the best ones that we can do, let me pop down to a little diagram we've been using. So what we've seen is yesterday, the majority of office workers were all in the office, right? And then overnight or in a matter of weeks, we needed to rapidly shift that to remote working. 
So we've started to see now everyone's sort of in remote. There's still some in, in the office. And of course, this is also just mostly talking about knowledge workers, right? Because we also acknowledge that there are plenty of people who are still continue to work and went to their place of work throughout the entire pandemic. So any essential workers, all of our healthcare workers, all of our um, our people who are, are on the street keeping us going. So we understand that that is also a workplace, but this specifically is talking about knowledge workers who were in a corporate office or in an office structure. That yesterday, most of us were there. Only a few, a small percentage amount of people had the ability to work from home on a regular basis. There was some trust that needed to happen there. Um, and then overnight we had to make that change and sort of rapidly shift everyone to uh, remote or distributed working. Uh, and I think it's pretty interesting as we are right now, we're starting to look at what does that near now look like? What does it look like as some states start to open back up? Potentially people start to go back into their office. And so that's where we start to see sort of this near now diagram where we're looking at still probably a lot of people over in that remote bubble, but some people starting to go back into the office and some crossover there to have some overlap back and forth. Um, and then we're looking a little bit at, you know, down the road. What does it look like in the sort of tomorrow of the world of when we go back? Does that balance recalibrate itself? Does it go back to what we've seen? Does it become something completely different that we haven't seen yet? So I think that's one of the things that um, our firm has started to look at is I think we challenge the presumption of um, the office being dead in that I think what we've all learned in this time is that we miss people. Yeah. We miss this. seeing each other one on one right now works, but it's not necessarily the same as being in a room with an entire panel and then all of the audience. There's a different energy and a different connection that happens when we're face to face. We've also seen that collaboration can be harder in a digital sphere. In some instances, it's easier depending on your tools. Focus work might be easier depending on if you have children at home or not because <laughs> every single working parent right now deserves a massive award for being able to do what is typically three if not four jobs all at once. Um, but, so we've seen a lot of different experiences that are happening and um, we're seeing that people miss people. They miss interaction, they miss collaboration. And then um, sort of one of the other big things that, that we're starting to see, and it depends on your um, on your organization, right? Depending on what your company culture is, there's a strong struggle right now for management or leadership to be able to evaluate their people in that the previous model that you see sort of on the yesterday circles here was really largely based on presenteeism, on people being there, watching people come back from a big presentation, seeing that big pitch, feeling that energy, knowing the pulse of the day to day simply by being around your coworkers. In the digital environment, that's a little bit harder to digest and understand. Some organizations have had great success with this. They might have already had remote working. So like many of our consultant clients, the big consultants or um, sort of financial folks that are generally sat in their clients' offices or some of the people who were largely on their site all day, they're used to being remote. So their cultures didn't necessarily have that same presenteeism. However, other companies that are very much in culture, they're struggling a little bit in this environment. They say, okay, so how do I make sure that my employees are, well, yeah, I can see they're productive, but are they being innovative? Are they connecting with us? Are we burning them out? How are they doing? That type of stuff is harder to do in the uh, digital environment or this remote and distributed uh, space if there's not the systems in place for that. So those are a couple of the things that we've seen during this time, during what the inverted workplace looks like for us, but we're very much looking forward. We're looking at what happens after this, what happens in our near transition term so that we're able to get people in to the workplace. And that's a focus on health, making sure that every single person is healthy and protected and taken care of. Then the next step that we look at is, how are we changing the way we work to be able to maybe adopt to, to physical distancing, social distancing in the workplace? Or what have we learned from this process of people being at stay at home orders or in quarantine and working remotely? What have we learned from that? And how is that changing the way we work? And then we're really looking again, like I said, to that long term impact to the tomorrows. And what's that revived workplace look like? How is it? What have, what has this global shared experience changed about the way we work? 
Yeah, no, I think whatever you say, totally resonate with me, Megan, especially some of the points, what brings to my point, like I spend a lot of time with technologists, like-minded people, because when the whole situation started, everybody started measuring. One thing is all of us were very good at adapting to technology and leveraging and making the best out of it. But when this started going on for months, now people are getting burnt to this way of working. This is where the whole analysis is coming out. Like the first month felt like, oh, are we being more productive if we are all remote because we're not commuting, we're not doing this, all of those things. But you touched on good points like the innovation and an execution. There are two phases and innovation will struggle. Execution could continue to happen if you are if you really don't need like minded people to brainstorm, come up with ideas. But there are some phases of project where you need that human connection, like you can have great technology, whiteboarding tools and other things. Those are great because I, I provide those things within Autodesk too. So I know how good they are, but they cannot replace what we used to have. And so it's a balance is what I would agree with you, that it's not this or that. How could we have a combination in future when we come out of this, where how could we survive not, not saying that everybody has to come to work, but there are roles that probably are more effective or phases of project when it is effective to be at place. And there are places where we'll have flexibility if we need to do it from home or wherever it is. Uh, that completely resonates with even for us being a technology company providing software for all of you. We see the similar trends. Mm -hmm. And so we started we started to try and come up with um, sort of buckets of understanding of what are the factors that might influence how we come out of this and what the transition looks like and the long term adoption of change looks like. So we started to look at what's flexibility to work anywhere and to be able to flex back and forth depending on the threat of a future pandemic, how to minimize that impact. Communication technology, we've all had all sorts of people your favorite video version of this, and we've been on it. We've been on all the different versions of it. We've seen the ones that work, we've seen the bugs that have it, and we've seen the security issues. But it's about that communication technology and being able to figure out how does it work for us and how do you ingrain it into the way you work. And then a focus on health and wellness. And I think this one's kind of important in that it used to be maybe a nice to have as like a perk that we would maybe see maybe only in the tech sector or, or in sort of like an up and coming company or maybe something that was actually physically in the health and wellness sector, they would have it as well, but not everyone had it. Versus now we're looking at health and wellness is important and it's more than just physical health and wellness. It's a lot about our mental and emotional health and wellness. Because what brings us to be the most productive employee and the most innovative and the most creative person, really that burnout is important to be paying attention to. And that, um, I'm gonna skip over, and then that, those really lead into that like human, the humanization of the workplace and leading with empathy and like your culture. So those we're starting to see are really tied together that previously those like six future future drivers that we were looking at, they might have been an all cart that depending on your, your company and your organization, you could pick which ones were the most important. And now we're starting to see that all six of those things are really integral to one another and are really important to be able to decide how do we advance all of those things? How are they integrated? How are we looking at ourselves in a more holistic approach? And then we can come back to these slides a little later on. So I'll, I'll add a little bit on the construction side of things. Um, and that was actually a, a very interesting presentation because on the one hand, so many of that is, is so true and so transparent and actually translates really well into construction. but. I think I think the construction industry is a little bit different in that there's there's a, there, there's kind of a clear hierarchy. Like I look at a construction. Out. Uh -oh. Did we lose Linda? Okay, so while Linda locks back in, maybe Charles, why don't we bring you on? Sure, that sounds great. Technology. Oh, there's um, Linda. <laughs> oh, there's Linda. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened, but. Um, you you dropped off for a second okay. and you're back now. Okay, so um, what I was saying was when I look at a, a construction project, I kind of see that there's, I want to say a hierarchy, and maybe that's not the correct word, but you kind of have a GC, and then you have consultants, and you have architects, and you have teams, and there's different layers of people. And I think what this has shown, I mean, for us, construction 
the only people that could really go remote in construction were really the GCs and some of the larger subcontractors that had the infrastructure and had the ability to implement the tech that already had technology in place or had the ability to kind of drive jobs forward. I think for a lot of the people that work underneath them in the kind of going back to that pyramid structure, they were really challenged because some of the small subs and some of the other people, they don't have the technology. Their technology is showing up on a job site and kind of getting the work done. It's a very hands-on, it's a very tactical, very tangible approach. But what I do see has happened, and I think this is definitely something which um, uh, has, been, has been prevalent in the last, I would say probably two months of this, is that those companies that did have certain elements of the infrastructure for technology, for producing 3D drawings, for being able to work with the architects and incorporate Revit or incorporate this modeling, somehow were able to accelerate and advance projects from a 3D basis, from a computer-based technology, so that it didn't sit sedentary. And whether it was you know, driving through the paperwork or you know, um, coordination of drawings, they were able to kind of maintain that. So I think there were different layers of it in construction that came through. And I think what it's also showing is that this kind of going back to what Megan said, there was kind of a past, there's the present that we're in, which we're kind of figuring out how to move forward, but there's definitively a different future as to how construction has to proceed because we don't know that this might not happen again. Hopefully it doesn't, but you don't know that. And how do you make yourselves Prepare it to not be stopped in your tracks. What are the ways yeah. in which you can keep your business working? You can keep productivity happening. Therefore, you can keep billing if you're in a home position. So, you know, some of the things which construction people at, with, with a lot of GCs and a lot of contractors are doing are implementing ways in which they can actually collaborate efforts and do stuff so that you know, we're not going to be able to have team meetings of 16 people sitting around a table any longer in a small room. You're going to have to be able to have breakout sessions and be able to do this. And the way to enable that, I think, is to do it is to do it virtually and to be able to work in this model that that is being established now. And that is a great time now to bring Charles in uh, for his piece. Yes. That's, uh, so, Linda, I am going to turn your camera off. Uh, okay. Please know all the all the panelists, you do have the ability to control your own um, mics and cameras too at the bottom of your screen. So Linda, I'm gonna turn it off for you and I'm gonna turn Charles. Uh, yeah. And uh, Charles, I hear you and we see you. And, and you tell me Charles when you're, you're ready and I'll pull up your presentation. Sure, yeah, you can go ahead and, and pull it up. Um, so I think you know back back to the back to the question. Um, I mean, you can uh, you know we sort of approached came at this a uh, little bit of a, a different way. We came at it thinking um, partly with a with a drive from our our clients asking us what are we what are we going to do and how are we going to do it. I mean, we uh, we had the capacity to work from home pretty well and and um, and. Uh, you know, obviously there were some some fits and starts with with getting technology going, um, but it but it but it kind of worked out. Uh, ended up working out pretty well. Um, you know, back to some of the the discussions. I mean, we are a diverse firm. We love to get together and meet. We just you know trying to trying to work through that collaborative environment. I think you can go ahead and flip to the next slide. Um, so uh, you know, one of the concerns was. What, you know, again, from a client standpoint, what can we do to get our people back in the office? Um, you know, like I said, uh, Texas was one of the first states to open uh, on, you know, May 1st um, and started getting people people right back on in. Um, this is a sort of a diagram we were doing for one of our clients and they said, well, are we good? Be, do we have the do we have the space um, to get back in? I mean, we have a good footprint and we we were starting to show them that some of these, some the for the for the near now or the current now, um, even your current spaces, even though you might feel that like they're generous, they're they're not. I mean, we're looking at at some spaces um, that are, uh, um, uh, you know, you you really start violating those social distancing practices very quickly. Um, and so, in some of our iterations, putting some things together um, in terms of looking at you know expanding density uh, in a more permanent fashion or working on working with them through some sort of phased uh, density occupation um, in their current workout what we're finding is that we're getting 
you know, anyway, from 40, 60, 70 percent reduction in the amount of people you can have in a space uh, just just trying to follow social distancing guidelines, not even taking into account, um, you know, whatever your state regulations might be. So, um, uh, so that was kind of a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. Um, and then I think to go to the next slide, uh, too, is trying to adapt. You know, now we're looking at trying to adapt offices um, for these sort of social distancing behaviors. Um, and uh, this is actually a look at our own office um, and, uh, you know, trying to, to, to steal some, some ideas from uh, uh, hospitals and, and healthcare professions about one-way travel and, and not intersecting other people, but that's not possible everywhere. So um, then you have to uh, make sure you're identifying where there is two-way circulation, um, making sure you're identifying that you know, there's there then becomes these sort of strong modifications to a space before you can even get even start thinking about putting people back into um, into that space. Uh, you know, again, sign it. So everyone understands where they need to wear their mask and where they don't need to wear their mask. Um, making sure that there is enough sanitation stations, and then you know, starting to look at what do people feel comfortable with, and and the other things like, do we need to install uh, 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 touchless fixtures everywhere? Do we need to start installing touchless uh, door openers? Um, and uh, for us, um, you know, uh, back to, to some of the things that um, uh, Megan was saying, we can flip to the next slide real quick, is it made us start to think uh, about what are the important things for us in the office. Um, and for us, the important things that the office, you know, did for us, um, again, if we're talking about only being able to get 40% of our workforce back in here safely uh, in the, 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 you know, now or in the near now, um, and we have to make, you know, uh, an investment uh, in in time, money, and energy just to make that happen. What can we do? Uh, what are the most important things about our office? And and those turned out to be uh, the things that we missed. Like like Megan was saying, is you know collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And the second thing, um, you know, sort of uh, subservient to that was, you know, some of the shared materials that are in office that we don't, that we can't touch and feel, um, you know, our samples, uh, the 3D printer, the laser cutter, um, you know, the, the, our, 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 uh, our tools that didn't come home with us. Um, and so when we, when we uh, sort of put all that out there, one of the things that we're, we're, we're trying to develop here is this idea of uh, the, you know, the office as this collaboration space and, and quote unquote war room, sort of a low residency model um, is what we personally are, are, are gearing towards. The idea of replacing these sort of fields of desks um, with uh, areas of um, collaboration, flexible spaces, instead of buying sneeze guards for every desk, we're talking about buying uh, uh, movable partition, you know, movable whiteboards uh, on wheels or whatever to separate spaces out um, so that we can still continue to have that collaboration um, and uh, still have that sort of the, you know, a handful of spaces for people to come in and work when they need to, um, but but really sort of capitalizing using the, the capital that we have now and directing it towards the important things, which is that, again, that collaboration um, that we have in our space. Um, and and honestly, we've we've started to pitch that to some of our clients that have asked us for for help getting back into theirs and and seen some uh, mixed feedback. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the I, I work a lot with higher ed uh, clients, and and um, you know, as the BAC is is well aware and well equipped uh, uh, to handle, um, you know that the the higher ed people are really sort of latching onto this and saying like oh we're already used to doing this sort of uh, active learning environments it's the new thing in education and the up and coming um, uh, a tool so so maybe it's not important for us to get back into our lecture classrooms maybe it's not important for us uh, to get back necessarily into the library so much as it is to get back into our active classrooms, into our labs, into our shared, uh, into our shared spaces. So um, that's been an interesting adaptation that we're seeing uh, starting to come through again with some of our clients and figuring out how to make that work. So, okay, about how we first uh, responded when the pan pandemic started and how are we recovering and how are we going to thrive when we come out of i think that that concept of those three and i feel this is more an iterative approach it's not like once and it done okay now we are in this 
recover more or respond more or thrive more because it also varies from country to country. You talked about Texas coming out first and we probably learn a lot during that approach and process and which can be then uh, uh, incorporated into other states which are probably still thinking about opening up. I think this is a complete cyclic iterative approach that we will continue to learn in these three phases where we continue to recover, thrive and respond to situations until a new normal comes. So I would say that's great. I think the first part we spoke about the workplace and how you guys are seeing. Maybe the next two things that we can tackle in the half hour we have is more on like what are the challenges you have seen contractors, architects or consultants to work differently? What are they going through? Maybe Megan, we want to get started and then we'll go to Charles before bringing Linda. Yeah, let me make sure I get that. So you're asking what is what are some of the challenges we face and how is it different in the specific design industry? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've definitely materiality is one of those things where um, I feel like a lot of our office has started to carve out a section of wherever they live, whether that's their home, whether it's their apartment for materials being directly sent to us so that we can put together a palette, really feel it, really understand it. And then also we've had to figure out how to assemble an entire palette to be able to send to a client so that they can have the same thing because we're really used to being sort of having those in-person conversations when we get in a room it's a design uh, development review we're looking at the model we're looking at the plans we're looking at the materials and it traditionally was for at least for us anyways it was a 2d 3d and tactile conversation so it's what uh, tools are there available for us now to be able to maintain that level of engagement with our clients and also that level of efficiency to be able to make sure that we're really looking at something spatially and that we're understanding those three-dimensional impacts and that we aren't reducing things to a line item on a spreadsheet to say oh well like that one's a little bit more expensive or I can't get that one in time or this one's having lead issues like that's where we want to make sure that we're still thinking um, about design first and we're thinking about experience first so I think that's a couple of the challenges we've seen there is what does that look like I think one of the things that we're gonna see and this is a challenge to the students out there if you guys can solve this you'll be ready to come into the workplace we're looking at one of our design actually Eliza, if you want to pull it up I think I have a slide on it where we were talking about what's the digital war room look like because we're so used to uh, yeah this one so we're so used to right now having a war room, having a space. I don't love the title, but it's effective what the room means. Uh, it's much like having a studio or in school uh, where we would go in there. You, there's something wonderful about tacking everything up on the wall, picking it up, looking at it, standing back, seeing if it passes the squint test, seeing if you can still see a design concept coming through, understanding is the, the diagram coming across. And there's that there's something special that's not that sort of transcends that productivity and really gets to that innovation or that creativity when we're all in a room together. So we started looking at what's the challenge? How are we going to do that moving forward? Right now, in an all digital environment, there's been different white digital whiteboarding tools out there. We've moved everything to BIM 360. We use Mural. We use Teams. We use all the platforms to be able to make sure that everything is in there, right? And then we do a lot of these with our clients. The cadence is different and changed. Um, so what we're looking for is in the next, when we come back, assuming that a fair portion of our population of work and or our clients are still going to be digital. There's still going to be time. And we don't know. That's our X factor, right? We don't know if it's going to be six months, two years, what, however long it'll be that as a global community, we're still hesitant for putting that, that density back together. So we're looking at saying, what's the virtual collaboration? How do you merge? physical people in one office with the digital sphere and how do we bring those together so how do we find that digital war room where you could still be all in a room working together and yet you could have the vr experience on the other side of everybody's sort of head popping up and you can all work together because that's one of those things that it's always um i don't know about you guys but i've been on plenty of conference calls when there isn't video or you're dialed in and everyone else is in the room and pointing to a floor plan and they're talking actively about oh we like this thing but not that and then if you're the person on the phone call you have to be like so which one can someone move the mouse on the screen please and it's the idea of how do we solve that problem how do we solve that and how do we bring the physical and the digital together yeah. to be able to maximize that um those minds in a space I agree. And there's so many people who are still shy of turning on video 
uh, it's getting mm -hmm. better uh, in the last three months because otherwise it's very difficult even though you're able to talk without having that body language and people you will not be able to make that sense yeah I, I completely hear you Charles how about you you know we've we have we've had some similar challenges um, it it's funny uh, to listen so we uh, our firm has a, a small office in Dallas uh, and we're, you know, we're obviously here in Houston. And so we were, um, you know, even before all this happened, we were sort of working out and trying to figure out how are we going to collaborate over that distance. Um, that tools like Ben 360 have been great. Tools uh, working in the cloud has been great. Getting the contractor involved in BIM 360 so that we can review RFIs and site conditions and things like that in, you know, digitally to an extent is great. Um, but again, that, that sort of, uh, there was always that that level of like, man, you know what? This week we're just gonna jump on Southwest and flying up there for the day because we need to hash this out in person. Um, and then this happened, and then it was like, well, I I absolutely cannot jump on a plane. Um, and so it really accelerated some of our, it, you know, it accelerated some of our learning and, and sort of figuring that out. And I think, um, it, you know, that was certainly a challenge. Getting people uh, organized was a challenge, and to keep from some sort of rehashing. You know, one of the things that we're seeing um, that's starting to pop up uh, now that we've been at home for uh, you know three months now almost is uh, people are seeing, um, and this is sort of a weird sort of thing, but people are seeing their uh, their home electric bill go up. Uh, people are seeing their their you know we're the I, we've had two guys have to upgrade their internet and they're looking and saying, well, we have to work from home. How are we how is this? Like how who's who's paying for this? Who's paying for my extra time at home and and for uh, you know internet upgrades and 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 things like that? Things that were supposed to be uh, uh, centralized. And so um, those are things we haven't quite figured out how to handle yet, and are still sort of working through. Um, and I think from a learning standpoint, one of the things that we've learned is that planning has been key in this sort of digital environment. Um, you know, we, we've we've talked about trying to whiteboard and, and and all of those things. And one of the things that we found is um, that's been you know it's been a struggle to uh, go over and, and sketch and run that run that red pen over over all the drawings and all of that. Um, what we found a little bit though is that that challenge. What we've done is we've shifted the uh, the the requirement for some of those things. So what we said is, okay, now we we've, we've set everything up in OneNote, for example, and everyone's got to drop their stuff in the day before the meeting, and you start your markups beforehand, and then we can go through it in the meeting and see what everybody thinks, and then we've sort of now we've moved the the discussion, I guess sort of earlier, instead of putting the onus on the meeting to develop a plan, we've let people sort of mull on it and create it beforehand. And in some ways that's created some really interesting and really cool outcomes that maybe we wouldn't have achieved if we just said, you know, we're gonna have a three hour charrette session at the end of the three hours, we're gonna have the window pattern figured out or whatever it is, whatever the description, the discussion for the meeting is, um, you know, I feel like Linda really echoed that, right? Yeah. The last time we were talking about this, in that, like, especially in the construction world, so much of used to be standing in front of a wall talking about how something was going to get done, and now it's about okay, how do we change that? What kind of how are we changing the way we work to be able to address some of these Absolutely. challenges? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys. Yeah, really. Um, so you know it's. This is just such an interesting discussion because I'm listening to you guys and, and um, you know, my brain kind of goes into and I did a lot of thinking prior to coming on here. And I think with so, so there's kind of micro challenges in construction and then there's like macro challenges. And I think one of the things that I know I have been and actually I'm involved with the project now, but it's also like what are our other methods to actually build? OK, so we have the opportunity to use modular construction. We have an opportunity to use uh, start, a SIP panel construction where so much of the work can be defined ahead of time. And quite frankly, you know, a lot of those homes can be built um, in computerized, you know, detailed models. You have to have interaction with the clients. You have to have decisions. And there are pros and cons to those approaches also because the, op the opportunity for customization is much less. So you don't have the ability to build at the same hyper level of detail because once those 
panels are built. And once that design is built, if you want to shift a wall, you have to change a model and you have to completely, you know, kind of reinvent and 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 and, and redesign a lot a lot of the components. But then I also think you have a lot of micro of micro challenges that are affecting. And, and again, you know, I work more in a privatized industry in terms of small private construction. Um, but I think right now the challenges are so vast to so many companies. First of all, just establishing protocols and establishing what's needed on not only a state level, but a, but a, a, a local level. And then more importantly, private level, meaning that certain buildings may have protocols that go that, that actually supersede the protocols that are already in place on a local and a state government. So you really have to be able to define that. There's a financial responsibility that comes with that and a financial investment that has to be made by all of these contractors to set up the sites. And then I think that also in turn connects to scheduling. Because now all of a sudden, you do not have the ability to maintain the same amount of people on a job site, and you have to adapt your schedule. We're not necessarily going to get extended hours because they're not going to let us work longer because it's louder. So how do, you, how do you approach that? How do you model that? How do you look at all of the components? How do you see what you can take off site and what you can do um, and, and kind of set up that virtual environment where people might be able to work while there's activity on the site? Um, but I think this goes a lot to a little bit of what uh, Megan and Charles and, of course, what you, Prakash, were saying with regards to the technology that's available. And I think that what I look at from the construction standpoint is that there are a lot of contractors out there who are already using BIM 360 and they're using all of these programs. But I think the scheduling software also has to be has to be a critical item that people have to understand. And whether it's project or Timberline or it's or it's Procore that kind of allows people to to to, to see it, you you need to set the baselines and you need to understand that if you know, that you're able to extend out and be able to show that to a client and what the cost implications are. So I think this is also an opportunity, and then I, and I'm trying to look positive through all of this, for people to kind of look at what tools they could potentially implement to keep their construction companies fluid, to keep them on the curve, to keep them being productive um, when they don't necessarily have, I mean, a war room for a contractor is a job site unless they're a large person and they have a back of the house infrastructure. Your war room is there. And like we were talking about on the call yesterday, the ability for collaboration um, in a virtual world or in a, um, is it can be so effective now with the architects, with the engineers, with the contractor, if everyone can work on the same platform. So there yeah. has to be, you you got to raise the level of education a little bit, I think, too, in the construction industry. And it's available. It's there. It's just not necessarily used potentially as much as it could be. And I think that will definitely be a, a really functional part of, of the future of how construction is seen. Yeah, I've said the technology is there specifically, but it's more adoption and usage. Absolutely. And the mindset, because people are used to doing things in a certain way. Absolutely. We are far behind. I mean, I, I love my contractors and I love construction, but they are far behind the curve. As far as we're concerned, they can draw it on a piece of sheetrock and build it, and they're okay sure. with that. But they have to adapt because there's just those, if those opportunities occur, that's great. And yeah. that's what it's about but they're not always gonna be there and you need to be prepared. This is all about yeah. thinking futuristically on how to um, how to keep this industry alive and growing with the curve. And, and, and it's there, it's, it's just education. Yeah. It's an education that's not yet put into place, I think. So. And catch up, I would say, this is a great time to have a positive Absolutely. spin. It's pushing everybody to catch up, to co-collaborate, leverage same tools, simultaneously uh, incorporate your feedback a lot of good things can happen so on that note right why don't we talk about the designer the role of a designer long term what do you guys see maybe linda will start with you what do you see from a role of a designer changing uh, is there discussions that are happening like a role of a designer in uh, coming out of this uh, whole situation will it change uh, or will they have any design impact from the way they operate or is it 
uh, any discussions around that lens. Hey, are you referring to the interior designer in yeah. perspective? Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's so many things going on with that right now. I, I think it will change, but I think a lot of interior design firms are actually ahead of the curve or some of the ones that I work with in terms of their use of technology. They, they have architects in-house. Designers are proficient in certain programs that they can interface with the architects. Um, I think the problem is going to be more so, um, you know, right now, I know what, what we're facing because we do some design within my company is, is just procurement of materials and kind of being able to assess what is available, what's used. But I also have to say that, you know, I've been working a little bit uh, with a friend, Janet, and, and with this idea of kind of health and wellness in design and, and whether it's, water features, um, lighting that is involved with circadian rhythms or human centric lighting, or whether it's you know ERV systems or water filtration systems, a lot of that plays into the design. And I think that we have to be cognizant of those systems. People, we have to, as, as contractors, as designers, you need to educate yourself on that. You need to educate yourself on what materials are, are more are less allergic and and what are what, what's a healthier environment I, I think I think it's a necessity of education not everybody's going to use it people are still going to want to have gold faux paint without a doubt but there 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 are people who are definitely interested in bringing in systems that will affect the design a hundred percent that you know, they want in their home. So there has to be, I, I think, I think that, I don't want to say that's the learning curve for interior designers, but I think they have to start to incorporate health and wellness into how they look at features for people's homes, or at least ask the question, at least bring it up as a point. Um, yeah. Cause I think it is sensitive. And I think if people knew that they had opportunities they would probably want to um, introduce them into their design. Agree. Yeah, Megan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's. I think there's three things and three ways that the uh, role of designer is going to evolve coming out of this. Um, one's about flexibility. We're constantly going to need to be able to flex it and to be able to adapt to what's coming, whether that's about a future pandemic or whether that's about climate change or whether that's about rapidly changing technology or the industry flexibility it's about being able to like look in all different directions and be able to be able to flex in which way you need to the second thing i think is really going to be a very important thing for designers to and this has been this is old so it's coming back but i think it's important is about human-centered design really thinking about people how we inhabit that and a holistic approach to human-centered design so that's incorporating that health and wellness that's looking at culture that's looking and I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd so um <laughs> learning from the like historic buildings because I am a little biased like our old historic buildings sort of did it well when it had natural ventilation when we didn't have giant massive bay widths there's a lot to be learned there so I think there's a lot about that human scale and that human centered design that we started to get away from and that we can come back to and then I think the third thing that really is going to change the designer's role and that and if we're starting to see this now and we're starting to understand it in the way that we can convey design but I think there's something really important about that experience-based understanding of design in that it's not just about a pretty picture it's not just about getting on zine or being in dwell it's about what's the experience what is this concept or what is this space what's our memory of how do we experience going through this and what experience are we trying to convey here and i think if designers can focus on those three things flexibility human-centered design and experience-based design, they'll be really ready for the next generation and be able to pivot as our industry continues to evolve. No, I think you articulated it very well in that three points. Charles, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so I, I, I think that's all fantastic. That's great and it's fun um, to see. I mean, it, it it's even fun to see some of those tools uh, that are helping us do that. You know, there's there's all these virtual walkthroughs and, and experiential, I mean, we're, we're really getting into VR um, that's been super helpful, you know, before, and I think it'll continue to be helpful moving forward and, and, and getting, uh, continuing, um, to help us in, in that, that aspect. I think from a functional aspect, um, I think it means that us as architects and designers are going to have to be, start being involved in the process earlier and stay on the process and stay more involved in the process later. 
um, we're, we're, I think we're used to, uh, you know, especially in some of these bigger projects, sort of having the, the owner hires someone to do programming for them who may or may not be involved in design. And then we come in and we, we sort of inherit a list of rules that we work around or that we have to work very hard uh, to change um, or adjust based on what 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 we want. And I think that what this is teaching us uh, for design uh, moving forward is that um, you know we we have that expertise to help shape those spaces and shape the program and shape the budget. Um, we really really. Um, you know, we've been sort of pushing to do it beforehand, uh, you know, a little bit. We always try and squeeze our way in so that we can we can push what we want. Um, but I think I think on a broader scale, we really need to be involved in that in that discussion um, uh, earlier, more often so we can help guide some of these discussions um, at the very beginning when they start allocating, when people start allocating a budget. Um, when they start allocating space, when they start allocating people um, so that we're not coming back sort of you know, breaking their hearts by telling them you can't do this or this doesn't work for healthy design. This doesn't help. Uh, this doesn't work for uh, your workforce. Um, that's that's always a hard, hard fight to fight. So if we're involved earlier to sort of help shape those discussions from the beginning, I think that'll help our profession moving forward. And then um, back to what sort of Linda was talking about is is being involved later. And for us as architects, knowing that we're going to be involved in that construction uh, process in that post-occupancy process, um, even more so, um, being able to, as a designer, think about how how are things going to be built, modeling them correctly, uh, and and designing them with the built environment in mind, so that we can we know and can say like these handful of pieces can be built in a factory and shipped out on the back of a truck so that we can limit the number of people on site or whatever. And starting to, to, to implement those types of discussions into our design so that we can then be a partner to the contractor moving forward and um, you know, utilize all of those other tools that we have. And then similarly be involved in sort of post-design process and then occupancy process, help owners um, and, and clients and, and users of these spaces, the people who actually own them, whether they own them monetarily or, or by, by occupation, right? Help them, uh, us help them um, mold the space and work the space the, 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 the right way and be a resource for them as they use their space and adapt to their space. And also for us to keep on learning about how does that, um, how does that process work? I think that oftentimes we get stuck in this, this idea as architects where we say, this is the way that it should work, or this is the way that I think people, that I'm designing this space to work this way, and then it doesn't necessarily work that way. 10 years down the line, you come back in and you look and be like, wow, didn't expect that. Um, and I think if we're involved in those sorts of, um, the, those, those sorts of discussions uh, six months after, a year after, three years after, five years after, and, and sort of stay involved in those projects, um, that will help us inform the next person. That will help us help our current clients adapt their space and stay in their spaces longer, um, and and give us a bit of ownership over over those uh, those spaces in a way that we maybe maybe don't um, uh, maybe so much right now. Cool, awesome. I know we got started getting questions here from the uh, to the panelists, so I'll read them out. And whoever wants to speak up, feel free. And others, if they want to add points, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll go through them. The first one is, do you see post-pandemic world having a lasting impact on how we work and how we approach the notion of office? I think it does. And I think we're starting to reshape what we think about uh, office space. Um, you know, even especially, I think early in the discussion, we talked about our own office space and what we really crave and and need out of that uh, out of that physical environment, and and what we need is that collaboration. And I think um, we're starting. I think there was a uh, you know, Megan had some discussions about being uh, from sort of a focus on being present. Um, and I think that it'll will sort of adapt and figure out what things do we need to be present. Is it a matter of showing up, or 
Is it a matter of being there and and um, and interacting? Um, and I think that that makes that maybe makes the office sort of a more interactive environment and maybe reshapes the way a lot of people, um, you know, do business. Uh, it's it's interesting. You know, you look at um, you know, uh, as architects, it's easy because we have we sort of have these project based, w very defined projects, a, a building as a project. Um, and so we can work on teams and we have these deadlines and we have these collaboration sessions and it and it's sort of pretty easy to, to adapt to. And some other companies don't. And there I know there was, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, of movement in, in the 70s, 80s, 90s with uh, with things like Six, Six, Six Sigma and Agile and trying to apply some of these project based notions to um, other modes of work that weren't so obviously project based. And I think that it might we might start to see the resurgence of some of those things in the workplace um, because of how uh, collaboration works and um, metrics of measuring things work. You're, we're no longer measuring people on are you are you in the office from eight to five? We're measuring what at the end of the week, what did you produce or what did you create? So so yeah, I think that it really will reshape. Um, the office environment and what we think of as office and how we treat the office. Yeah, and uh, how about uh, educational institutions? Maybe Megan, or uh, if you have, because we have so many students watching us, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure they have. Like, okay, you're talking about office and work. Well, that's great. What about all the educational institutions? What about our schools? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I think that's something that's really key too. So we've seen sort of three things from our clients, right? We've seen from our clients ask are we gonna be able to reduce our square footage? Are people gonna just not be coming to these spaces that we've spent so much money on and spent so much time on? And not, primarily one of the biggest bottom line, one of the biggest line items in a budget is your physical space. Whether that's your classrooms, whether that's retail floor space, whether that's a restaurant and it's your seating or whether that's a corporate office and it's your workspace. So we're seeing that question, will we be able to reduce our square footage or not? And I think we've taken a really optimistic look at that in that, um, some of the larger places, institutions and some of the larger like workplaces might be able to change some of their scale because they might be having some more people at home. However, we think it'll actually be a shift and then like a reallocation. So it would be about shifting to those different space types. So for in education, um, sort of like Charles said earlier, it might be about instead of all the lecture halls or small classrooms, it might be more about lab spaces or testing something out. And it goes sort of back to that idea of that experience that we were talking about before. And we may see sort of a shift in how we allocate those square footages. One of the other major things, the other major changes that we're starting to see is to reshape our processes and our workflows. We can see that in retail, we can see that in education, and we can see that in hospitality already, right? We already see it in the grocery store. There's already those little one-way signs. Bless all the environmental graphics people out there who have gotten that out with a quickness so that we aren't seeing those heinous, ugly, caution yellow tapes and all the hacks. We're proud and glad for the signage that's now there to show us which way to go. We're seeing that in our education spaces. Teachers just moved on a dime, switched over to Zoom. All of the prep work they're having to do to be able to teach and to engage in a different environment. So it's really about changing that process and that workflow. We're seeing that really impacted. And then I think lastly, the biggest thing we're seeing is culture is key. And there's empathy, leading with empathy. And everything that we do, we're recognizing that this is a shared experience. Not only is there a global pandemic going on, the financial things that come along with that are kids not being in school. And then you add on to a civil movement that is gaining um, wide, massive support across our country. It's listening and understanding that that takes a very real toll on us as people, as designers, as end users. So to really bring back that empathy in, I think that's one of those long-term shifts that we're really seeing. Yeah. To touch on some of the things that we're seeing from our educational clients is, you know, we're, we have a project that's nearing completion now, and we are seeing that shift, shift to, uh, you know, more digital learning cameras in every classroom. Um, it's been a scramble to try and get all those in, um, you know, before they before they bid this project. but. But we really, even beforehand, you know, we're looking at these active learning spaces, and as again, as the BAC well knows, uh, you know, distance learning works works pretty well, but it only works if you have those sort of interactions as well, and those 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 uh, those empathy and, and creative environment spaces where people actually are getting together. So, um, again, we're seeing a shift away from uh, classrooms, and we've they've actually asked. I mean, we're doing this project so that all of the classroom walls can just come down if they need them. 
uh, and moved into more more lab type environments, more makerspace type environments, so that the school, uh, the the educational facilities are being used as uh, learning laboratories, as opposed to um, just sort of uh, seated lecture halls. Yeah. I know we're at the bottom of the hour, so why don't, why don't, I know, I feel like we can talk for hours. We are very passionate about this topic, but at the same time, why don't we have a quick 30 second closing thoughts from each one of you on what do you, what do you want to, uh, the, the students who are watching this from our Boston Architecture College or elsewhere, what are the key takeaways that they should keep in mind when leaving this whole uh, chat of inverted workplace? Megan, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say bring that innovation. Don't lose that fire that you've got in school right now. That's going to be one of the most important things to bring into the workplace, right? Like we need the next generation to help us solve some very big and very real issues. We're going to need a lot, but the design world itself needs to change. We need to figure out how to find that innovation, that balance between productivity, wellness, your own boundaries, your own health, and be able to come in, be efficient, but be creative at the same time. And that's easy to say, but very difficult to achieve. So I think that's one of those things that as I look back during my time in grad school, shout out to the dad, uh, that there was a real energy and creative problem solving that might get hard to maintain as you get into the world. Keep that. Keep it as much as possible. Come in and say, why? Ask, how can I make this better? What can we do differently here? Is this system working for us? Uh, one of my colleagues and I have a joke that we always ask in a process for ourselves. It's, okay, this might be crazy, but what if? And we put on our what if hat and we throw out an answer and then we talk about it and we go back and forth to figure it out. And then we say, we should write that down. Okay, what's next? And that's so valuable. So don't lose that fire for problem solving and for uh, innovation. Because as you get in, there's gonna be a lot you have to learn, right? Coming out of school, there's a lot about documentation. There's a lot about how an office works. There's a lot about interacting with the client. Don't let yourself go on information overload. Make sure you retain that uh, constant curiosity. Awesome. Charles? Learning. Keep, keep learning and keep questioning uh, everything you do. Um, uh, keep, uh, keep trying to refine everything you do. Uh, you know, one of the things that's really helped us through this process is being able to sit and say, this thing that we're doing is the best way. Um, and if it's not the best way, how can we tweak it? And don't be afraid to step up and say something. Um, you, you, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the best way to sort of to, to get ahead and push and, 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 and to keep on learning is to ask questions and uh, to make yourself heard. Um, you'll, uh, you'll learn more. Uh, from your peers. You'll learn more uh, from the people above you and below you if you continue to keep asking and questioning and questioning and asking. Um, I think that's the that's the big takeaway. Cool. And Linda? Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of add a little bit about, I mean, this is architectural college and I respect that, but coming at this from the construction side, once again, I think what I would probably want students of architecture and people who are gonna be going into this field to know is that collaboration is key. Um, and I think that there's been a, a kind of a separation in the past between like the contractor and the architect. It's kind of been this back of the house, front of the house. And I think we have to look at teamwork. We have to look at collaboration. Um, I think we have to inspire one another to educate each other and to teach each other different practices on how we can work better together, because if we can work better together, we can achieve more. Um, and it, it should be that, that kind of one service um, helps another um, and advocate for one another in that regard as well. Um, I see one of the questions came up as architects, what new markets are available. I know a lot of very high end GC firms that have architects who work in house. 
So you're an architect, but you're basically fundamentally a key person in a general contracting firm. And I know that a lot of the modular companies especially are doing that because there's so much architecture that is brought in in modular construction. So I think for me, the takeaway that I want to give is contractors are definitely a little bit behind the curve when it comes to where you're at with technology and where you're at with things. But we also can be extremely helpful to your process as you can be to ours. So if we can strengthen that collaboration, I think that's going to be a huge push for us in being able to kind of recreate that workspace that we have to share. Awesome. That's great. And my, my two cents or closing thoughts to all of you will be change is constant. This is this is going to you will see this throughout your careers, too. Uh, and when you get into the corporate world to all the students out there, change is going to be constant and have this open mind of adapting to change rather than resisting to change. And then you'll have fun when you do that. And so have the as, as everyone mentioned, have the learn it all mentality rather than know it all and then enjoy and have fun with whatever you do. And that's what is super, super important. And so thank you all for joining and thank you, Linda, Charles and Megan for an engaging conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Hope you guys enjoyed it too. Uh, give feedback and take care and stay safe. Stay healthy all. Thank you.